we always have our programs, and we always include the, the great work that our Latinas do and our professionals in Hispanic marketing because, you know, they're awesome. I mean, I think of our uh, Marketing and Achievement Awards, I think it's about half our women, Daisy Esposito and um, Norma Orsi and all these lovely women that, you know, they've been the driving force um, behind Hispanic marketing because, as we know, the women make all the decisions in, 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 in Hispanic marketing. They really do. You know, the guy who's sitting home watching soccer, he's, he's got his burrito and he's happy his beer, and, you know. And mom, <laughs> mom's making all the decisions. The guy has nothing to do, you know. So that's why we have, and, and we're very fortunate to get Heidi Pellerino. Pellor am, I, am I pronouncing her right? Because I'm from Minnesota. Where's Heidi? Pellor Pellerano or? Pellerano. Boy, Minnesota, you know. Yeah. But um, I'm going to get my glasses on here because I just noticed I couldn't see anything. But Heidi's joined Wasserman Media Group in uh, 2007 as Senior Vice President Projects in Multicultural Marketing. And now you're, you're, you're Vice President of Brands, am I right? Or is Executive Director, or but Executive Vice President. We want to mention that. That's, that's a great uh, promotion. Um, prior to Wasserman, uh, 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 Heidi served as Director with Raleigh North Carolina-based sports and entertainment consulting firm on Sport, which was acquired in 2007 by Wasserman. In that role, Heidi was responsible for strategy and client management for Nokia sports and music properties. In this capacity, the team developed a comprehensive music strategy for Nokia that resulted in a successful launch of two venue partnerships, including the Nokia Theater, LA Live, and Club Nokia. Um, Heidi joined on sports in 2004 as a member of the American Express team, where she was involved with the analysis of American Express portfolios of sports, venue, entertainment, and ticketing partnerships. Uh, needless to say, we're, we're very pleased to have uh, Heidi with us. How about a big hand here? Big Minnesota welcome. Thank you, everybody. Can you hear me? I can't never tell when you're up here. OK. Um, I'm going to have to really, every time I get invited to these, I'm always the person standing between you and lunch or between you and drinks. <laughs> so I always have to bring my most entertaining act to make sure I keep you guys engaged. Um, the first thing I like to do is really get an understanding of who's in the crowd, because I like to cater what I'm talking about to you guys. It's not about me listening to myself. I've heard this speech many, many times. So I want to make sure that you feel this is useful and actionable to you. Uh, so just from a show of hands, how many of you come from brands? Okay. A couple of brands, OK. Uh, agency people? All right. And then properties, right? The rest of the group back here? OK, awesome. Um, please stop me at any time. I don't mind being interrupted, ask questions. Um, again, because I want to make sure this is of use to you. Um, so I broke down the, um, the presentation into three uh, key buckets. Uh, the first is level set the importance of the consumer. You know, I always talk about this being a spectrum, and I think there's some companies, as you've heard Honda and you've heard others like Coca-Cola mention uh, in the soccer pyramid, that are probably on the far right of the spectrum. They get it, they believe in it, and they made an investment, right? Then there's others that get it, sort of believe in it, and therefore the investment doesn't quite follow, right? There's others that are saying, I know I need to be doing something, I'm not ready for it, right? Because the comment made earlier, they're assimilate, right? Like if I do this, I get them, right? And they're waiting. Uh, we have a couple of clients that, you know, every time I go in and talk to them, they're like, no, we actually commissioned some research to tell us, you know, how important this segment's gonna be. And I always say, do you want me to tell you right now what the research is gonna, you know, the results of the research studies? No, no, we'll talk when the research study comes out. I say, I can't wait to see it, but I'm pretty sure I know what's gonna say. You need to be investing in multicultural marketing, right? Um, so we'll go through that, then we'll do a deeper dive on the Latina. It was funny seeing uh, Nancy present earlier, because the reason we talk about this, if you look at it, first of all, from a research perspective, there's barely any research on Latinas from a sports perspective. Most people that invest in sports sponsorship 
do not talk to the Latina consumer, period. Uh, I went to representation one time, and I won't name the brand, um, but they were so struck by how to leverage it because their product was targeted towards Latinas, so they decided to showcase the Latina as the person that put the gathering together for others to watch sports. I'm pretty sure we can say Nancy is a diehard sports fan. All right, if we, so that's one of the things we'll talk about here, and then we'll talk about some tips, right? Some things that you can think about, and hopefully try to bring some of the conversation we saw earlier together. Uh, so the importance of the consumer. We always start with this. Don't get caught up in the numbers because it just depends on what you count. Some people don't count Puerto Rico, other people count Puerto Rico, then there's the differences in numbers, et cetera. But just in general principle, this is an important segment today. Right? If you don't get that, that's pr problematic, right? Why is it? It's not just the sheer size, right? There are statistics that show if you take the Hispanics in this country, it will be the 12th largest economy in the world. So wouldn't you be marketing to the 12th largest economy in the world if you're a marketer, right? So it's also the, the size of the population in terms of percentage, right? It's 17%. But it matters, right? $1.2 trillion in purchasing power. I'm pretty sure as a marketer, you want a slice of that. But also there's misconceptions, right? A lot of people think they tend to be poor, they're the immigrants. But you know what? One in four Hispanic households make over $75,000, right? So that is very consistent with the mean household income in this country. But what we like to talk about is if you're not quite there on the bandwagon yet, this is a crucial segment for tomorrow. And here's some basic statistics that prove that. First and foremost, 60% of the population growth in this country is driven by Hispanics. But the people think it's immigration. No, it is not net-net immigration. It is birth. I think it was 2014 into 2015, it was the first year in a number of years that the net migration in and out of this country equaled zero as many people are coming in as they were leaving going back to their home countries. So the growth is not being driven by that. So one in four births in this country today are from a Hispanic mom, okay? So the other key, like we talked about, the immigration, they're US born. So that changes the composition of this segment completely. And then they're very young. 40% are under 21 years of age. When you talk about most people when they're marketing, they're coveting you know, that 18 uh, plus demographic age. I always talk to my company uh, with one of our groups that say, no, we're youth marketers. I'm like, what does that really mean? Because if you're a youth marketer, you better be a multicultural marketer. So this is, I love this slide because it, it brings a lot of memories from my own experience, but most people say, you know, it's just the traditional markets, right? The gateway markets, it's the Chicago's is the uh, Florida, is the Texas, is the California, is the New York, right? But this is census data that shows the fastest growing Hispanic markets, right? Charlotte, North Carolina, Raleigh, North Carolina. When I moved to this country, uh, I moved because my mom was going to the University of North Carolina to get a PhD. We moved to Chapel Hill, North Carolina. If you want a culture shock coming from San Juan, Puerto Rico to Chapel Hill, North Carolina, uh, in the summer when you're, it's a college town and there's no college students there, that's a culture shock. For us, I think we were probably one of the few Hispanics there. Uh, most of the Hispanics there had to do with the university. So my mom and I used to drive an hour to Fort Bragg just to be able to buy beans and plantains. So to see that Charlotte and Raleigh are the two fastest growing Hispanic markets blows my mind. Because when we moved there, that seemed just not even possible. And look at the market here, Minneapolis, St. Paul, in the 12th. And that's going to continue to be. So a lot of times when I'm talking to people, people go, I'm in Portland. I don't need to worry about this. Or I'm in Denver. I don't need to worry about this. I'm pretty sure you need to. For the people in this room as marketers, right, why do this, this segment matter? Let's talk about from ticket sales, right? Nancy talked about butts and seats, right? If you pick any industry, you know, paper today or magazine, what are they talking about? How do we win with millennials? How do we get millennials to come to our ballpark or to our arena, et cetera? 
Well, to me then, if you're trying to figure out how to win with millennials, that means you're trying to figure out how to win with Hispanics because Hispanics represent 20% of the millennial population in this country, right? So let's talk about from a sponsorship perspective. We always talk about that. You know, as a sponsorship department, your job is to try to figure out how to get more brands to spend, right? The part that people don't connect is if you do a good job as a property to draw the Hispanic consumer, a lot of brands are struggling to figure out how to connect with the Hispanic consumer. So that's a win-win, right? If you find the right partners and you work collaboratively to develop sponsorship platforms that not only uh, bring in the Hispanic consumer into your ballpark or your uh, stadium, and then at the same time that allows the sponsor to be able to communicate authentically and create engagement with them, that's a win-win. Why? Because when you think about it, Hispanics represent are the key drivers of growth. You know, there's been the CEO of Coca-Cola and other CEOs have said, for me to hit my revenue goals over the next 10 years, I have to win with Hispanics. If I don't win with them, I can't grow our company in the vision that I have, right? And that just represents some examples. Beauty, uh, anything that is baby related, right? We talked about one in four moms. So these are, you know, and also in, in you start looking at things like technology, right? And we'll talk a little bit about my, more about that. But you know, we talked a little bit about auto, right? Hispanics are driving growth. They're driving the, the growth in home buying, et cetera. So from a marketer perspective, you have to think about, for me to reach certain goals, I have to do a better job reaching the Hispanic consumer. We also talk about, I had this conversation one time with Madison Square Garden, and they went, I don't know how you can help me. I fill out my arena every day. So what can you do for me? So this, they were actually the impetus for this slide because I said, um, so tell me, what do you track from a P&L perspective? Is it just ticket sales or do you track other items? It's like, well, we have camps, we have merchandise, we have all these things. And I said, okay, so who's gonna show up to your camps, right? It's kids. What is their age group? So we talked about, do you know that 33% of Hispanics are under the age of 18 compared to 24% of the general market? And if you live in New York, that number is even higher right or you take a look at merchandise the fact that three quarters of hispanic uh, actually purchase sports memorabilia you saw it in the video from the de la riva group right they all have their jerseys they have their you know their armbands anything right and we did our own proprietary study which i'll talk a little bit about and we were able to prove that that's the case that hispanics over index in actually purchasing during live events um, so this is uh the we did this study um, the reason we did this study was because we really found um, that there was not a lot of accurate data available. I think if you've ever seen a lot of studies um, that talk about sports, uh, you'll see that at the bottom it says like the ESPN sports poll from 2011, right? And sometimes you feel a little bad talking to your clients now in 2015 and 2016 using 2011 data, right? The other thing we found is that most of the studies out there lumped Hispanics together. So when we ask like, who formed the, 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 the group, right? It's like, oh, well, it was a survey of 300 Hispanics. And I'm like, what kind of Hispanics? Were they sports fans to begin with? Were they male? Were they female? Were they millennials? And they are not able to answer that. So uh, because we were so frustrated, we went out and did our own study um, so that we're able to help push the industry forward. And here's some statistics from our study, right? And we love these because it really does break against what most people expect, right? A lot of times our, we have clients that say, well, Hispanics are lower income brackets, so they're not gonna attend as much, right? Our study shows that 23% of Hispanics attend live events compared to 17% of non-Hispanics. And this is all sports fans, right? So these were self-described sports fans. Um, here, uh, the second thing is, okay, you talked about their income and all of that. Well, our study shows that they're most likely to not only purchase food, drinks, and souvenirs while attending the event. And they also go in larger groups. I think Nancy mentioned that. She would buy eight season tickets, right? So those are things that are very important, and the proof is there. It's not just speculation. This is the other part that's very important, right? We talked about the importance of being able to create these partnerships with brands to create more sponsorship. sponsorship. So we wanted to measure the effect of sponsorships. Uh, on the Hispanic sports fan. And what we found is that Hispanics say they're two times more likely not only to consider and trust a brand that sponsors their favorite team, athlete, or sport. We also found that they are more likely to purchase and have purchased from those brands over the last 12 months. 
So if you see that pyramid that uh, was shown earlier with the soccer DNA presentation, that tells you they're very aware of the brands that support it, and they're spending money behind it because they know it's authentic, right? You talked earlier about trust and building trust in the community. It's not just doing it because you want to do it. It's to actually invest in the things that matter to them, and they will reward you for it. Any questions so far? All right, so let's talk about the Latinas. So I think we talked a little bit, Richard talked about this. The data supports it. You know, 86% of Latinas report that they're the primary uh, decision maker in their home spending. So as a brand, right, if you're not talking to the Latina who's actually very, very involved in the decision making process, including the season ticket purchases, um, then you're missing a big opportunity, right? The other thing that I like is the fact that a lot of times they talk about um, you know, the growth of the segments and how they're, you know, the trajectory. Look at this trajectory. The Latinas are expected to represent 30% of the entire female population in this country by 2060, while the white female population is going to decrease 43%. Right? Those are very significant stats. When we talk about it's not just important today, you have to plant the seed today so you can get the benefits down the future. Also from a, uh, you know, social media, we talked about this and technology. The uh, Latinas are more likely than non-Hispanic uh, Latinas to use smartphones. I had this argument with a telecom uh, client one time where they're like, no, no, Hispanics, they, they have this, they definitely use our plans, et cetera, but they don't have smartphones. And I'm like, what data are you looking at? Don't you have sales reports? Like, this is a pretty significant number to me. And they didn't understand that, right? Like, why would they invest this kind of money in this type of devices? I said, because that's everything, right? That's the computer. It's their, you know, not only their telecommunications device, but it's a lot of things, right? It's the gaming. It's the, to be able to watch TV on the go. So they're going to invest in the very best, right? So those are things that are going to be very important to keep in mind. Um, also, we talked a little bit about, and we'll talk more about marketing through culture. You know, a lot of times people talk about bicultural, and the best way I can uh, explain bicultural uh, to people is uh, we talk about heart and mind, right? And I think um, it was also in the De La Riva presentation. Being bicultural, I don't know, how many of you qualify yourselves as bicultural? So hopefully, let's see if this is proven true. Biculturals, they're Hispanic with the heart, they're American with the mind, right? We talked about that, the passion, but the, the logical, when you start making decisions, you, you think about it, you're more thoughtful, which are qualities more so often associated with Americans, right? So that's what it means to be bicultural, right? Um, so 87% of Latinas that are bicultural want to stay bicultural, right? A lot of people always have this belief that's going to be assimilation, right? I mean, I've heard Soledad O'Brien speak, and she says, man, when we moved, right, think about it, we're Cuban, half white, half African American, in the 70s, my parents said, just blend in. That's all, that was the, that was the lesson. Please blend in. Like, and so that's what they learn. And people say, okay, that's what's gonna happen to everybody else. No, when there's 55 million strong, you don't have to blend in anymore, right? And that's what you have to start thinking about. That's why there's this whole concept of that white people don't like acculturation and things like that, because that's going away because people are retroacculturating, because they're talking about this, right? People are trying to hold on to their language, they're trying to hold on to their traditions, and those that lost it are making a commitment to bring it back so they can pass it on to the next generation, right? So you talk about one-fifth of Latinas uh, surf in Spanish when they're surfing the, uh, the web, and one-third are very comfortable going back and forth Spanish and English, right? Um, and then 69% want to keep their culture alive and pass it to their family. So we'll talk a little bit about more about what that really means. In our study, one of the things we also wanted to do to prove that uh, the Latinas are also big sports fans is if you look at this graph, I don't know if it's easy to see, but you know, we looked at the fact that we compare female and male Hispanic sport fans, and we found that they're, uh, they have very similar preferences. What changed was the order ranking. For the Hispanic female uh, Olympics moved up significantly compared to the uh, male. In this chart, what we wanted to show you was the female Hispanic sports fan with the female non-Hispanic sports fan. So you see the difference, right? Um, 
I think it's that orange uh, bar, kind of is the uh, Hispanic uh, sports fan, and then the yellowish uh, bar mustard is the uh, non-Hispanic uh, female. So you see NFL pretty significantly, followed by Summer Olympics, and then look at the draft NBA, right? The NBA does really, really well with Hispanic females, right? Because the NBA has done a really good job culturally, uh, you know, reaching a younger demographic, an urban demographic as well. So you see some of these things here uh, reflected in the study. Look at the difference with boxing, right? Boxing doesn't really resonate uh, that well with the non-Hispanic female. It resonates really well uh, with the Hispanic female. So those are things that you want to keep in mind because when you're marketing, right, a lot of people, and you know, I love soccer, and I don't mean to say that's not an option, but a lot of people just think about soccer as their only option. And we always try to say, and we'll talk about this later, segment your, your group and tell me which Hispanic you're trying to reach, and then I can tell you if soccer is the right vehicle to reach them or not. Any questions on this? All right, so let's get to more practical stuff, right? You, you have the baseline of what we're talking about. Let's talk about how do you market to them. And feel free to engage if you've done best, you have your own best practices to share, et cetera. We can talk about that. I always try to simplify it into six core things. Maybe I, I should have listened to the rule of three. Um, but I have two rules of threes. Does that count? Yeah, two rules of three. OK, and I'm going to not go into all of these in complete depth because I know I'm standing between you and lunch. But I'm going to try to cover most of them. Segment the market. Um, I don't know if there's anybody from NASCAR here, but um, we were asked to go speak to NASCAR. And they said, hey, you know, we, we're really committed to Hispanics. We really want to do a better job of, of reaching Hispanic consumers. Can you go talk to our partners? And I said, which Hispanic consumers? I'm still waiting for an answer, right? They just said Hispanics, right? The, that 55 million. Can you go help me figure out how to get the 55, right? So the importance of research right there. Who is, you know, so we'll talk a little bit about that. National versus local, I think you saw that with the examples. You know, Minneapolis, very different market than you'll experience in Milwaukee. And a lot of marketers, that's where they struggle because when you start looking at limited budget, limited resources from a personnel perspective, and now you have to figure out how to create national campaigns and localize them, people are sitting there going, what do I do? So we'll talk a little bit about that. Year-round exposure, I think we mentioned the uh, promotional nights and the NBA platform and stuff like that. What I always tell people is, first of all, uh, you know, a lot of people try to market during Hispanic Heritage Month. I can tell you Hispanic Heritage Month means nothing to me, right? I don't even know how many people know what Hispanic Heritage Month encompasses. It's just, it made a, a president of this country very happy that he could announce that he supported the Hispanic community because there was like six countries that between September 15 and October 15 happened to celebrate their independence. I've seen people argue that the Cinco de Mayo is Mexico's independence, right? So just because you do a Cinco de Mayo campaign <laughs> doesn't mean you're marketing to Hispanics. Hispanics are Hispanics year round. If we talked about one in four Hispanics moms, you know, or, or one in four moms in this country is Hispanic, what are you doing around Mother's Day? If they have larger households, what are you doing around Halloween? Right? There's so many opportunities to market to this segment around the year and actually potentially get share of voice because not everybody else is marketing around those time periods. Um, be authentic. We talked about this, right? Um, I always say that Hispanics are a little bit of what people say the youth used to be in terms of how they perceive marketing. They're very skeptical of it, right? I think Hispanics are the same way. They know and they can test it when it's just a check the box exercise versus when it's a true commitment, right? And we talked about when people just do something, they tried it, they disappear, and then maybe they try something again you're not gonna get the support, you're not gonna get their dollars, right? Uh, educate before selling. I think this goes back to the trust comment that was made earlier. Um, the best example I use with this is my brother. My brother's an engineer at NASA. Pretty intelligent guy. But he grew up in Puerto Rico. My mom was a college professor, so he went to the university, it was paid for and all that. He moves to this country and his daughter's about to go to college. And he's like, what is FAFSA, Heidi? Like, I, 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 don't, I don't know what this is, 
right? So I called a few of my friends and said, I'm just curious because to me, I had to go through that process because I went to the university here. Um, and I'm like, wow, this is a very intelligent person that's never had to deal with FAFSA. Um, so I called a couple of my friends that were uh, first generation uh, Hispanic American, and they told me. They went through the entire college process on their own because their parents didn't have a college education, certainly not one from this country. So they just showed their parents where to sign, right? There's a huge information gap, right? Especially if you think about financial services, if you think about health insurance, right? There's huge, huge information gaps that we as marketers can help, teams can help. Instead of doing a, a theme night where you bring the uh, beautiful dancers of, the, of Mexico, how about doing a night where you help these people figure out income taxes? Helping them how to figure out how to help their kids go to college. Those are really practical applications that help them understand that you understand what their needs are. Um, and build a relationship. For most part, you know, we've done this and asked a group of people, hey, how did you get your insurance, like your car insurance? It was usually somebody's referral, right? How did you get your dentist? <laughs> a referral, right? So that's how the Hispanic market tends to operate. It's very referral, or it's like, my parents had it, right? If you think, if you ask anybody, like, why do you use Colgate? Well, my mom uses Colgate. Do you know if Colgate has any advantages over Crest? No, right? So that's a very important part. The relationship aspect of the community is very important to keep in mind. So let's go through some of these uh, fairly quickly. The importance of segmenting the market. So we talked about our study a little bit. So usually when you see statistics out there, most people will show you maybe column number two, right, in the middle, but they won't tell you what it is, right? They just say Hispanics. Soccer is king. But if you look at it, if you aggregate Hispanics as a whole, NFL actually has a much larger reach within the segment. But yes, if you start peeling the people that identify as more unacculturated, so more Spanish dominant, uh, more closer roots to their home country, yes, soccer comes to the top. But what happens if you're trying to market in Miami, where I live, where you still have a significant you know, Cuban American population and you're trying to create something for them, you're not gonna do it necessarily with the Dolphins or with the Fort Lauderdale Strikers. You're gonna wanna do it through baseball if the Marlins ever get their act together. All right, so uh, to localizing, we talked a little bit about that, right? So what are some effective ways to localize your plans? That's where social media really comes in. And again, these numbers are from our study, and these are specific to sports fans. What we talked about was, you know, do sports fans just, are they just following, or are they in actively involved in the content, right? So what we found is that they are actually not only consuming it, but they're active participants. They're sharing it. They're sharing it with their networks at a much higher rate, as you see, than non-Hispanics. When you look at their networks, they use a lot of different networks, and we'll talk a little bit about the different uses of them, but because a lot of them have families, Facebook is still a predominant platform for them within that. Um, then the smartphones, right? We talked about this. The smartphone is not just, it's also a very important tool for them from a sports consumption perspective, right? And also, that actually breaks down to smart TVs and all of these other latest and greatest technology, right? So they can watch the, all the soccer content that we showed, uh, that was seen earlier. Um, so those are some important statistics there. So how do you create an engaging digital social campaign, right? There's four keys. Again, I'm breaking the rule of three. Um, authenticity, right? And we'll talk about a little bit that later in terms of, you know, we touched about you have to understand there's a role for each platform, right? They don't use one platform. They understand the role of each platform. It's important for you to understand that. Um, context, right? It should never feel that authenticity, right? Each platform has a purpose and your messaging within that has to be authentic to that platform and be providing the right context. You know, if the consumer comes in and sees this and goes, why is such brand here? You missed it, right? Um, the storytelling, right? It's all about storytelling, right? We talk about millennials value experiences. Why do they value experiences? Because they want to have something to tell, right? To share, 
right? So that's very important. And then the creativity, right? It has to draw some sort of emotion, right? That's what's going to get people to respond and engage with your content versus just seeing it and moving on, right? So let's talk a little bit about the platform. I know this is hard. It might be a little hard to follow, but uh, you'll get this presentation. But we always talk about there's a role for each of them and therefore a message, right? So if you look at something like Facebook, you know, Facebook is not where you're going to put any significant content from a what's happening from a sports perspective, right? It's more like here's where you can actually show your love for the team, right? But when you start looking at it and you go and start looking at an Instagram, right? That's when you have people posting their selfies and their, you know, their interaction with the at a Timberwolves game, for example. But then you go to Twitter, that's when you start sharing that moment, right? Like did you see that moment? Did you see that dunk, right? So each of these platforms, right, have an important role, and it's important for you guys as marketers to sit back. That doesn't mean you have to do them all, right? Don't do them all if you're not going to do it right. But pick the right platform for what you're trying to deliver, right? For a team, that might be completely different than it would be for a brand, OK? Uh, so let's talk about a couple of things. Uh, we always, always inevitably, no matter who we're talking to, get asked. Can you tell me what I need to do about language? Do I need to do it in Spanish? Do I not need to do it in Spanish? Can you just please, like, I could speak for hours, and then at the end of the day, that's their only question, right? So we talk a little bit about this. Guys, goes back to understanding your market, the research, the segmenting. In some instances, like the N uh, NBA example, right? The NBA said, we are going after the bicultural that lives both in Spanish and in English, the heart, the mind. So that's why they use Spanglish, because that's how that consumer behaves. If you look at the NFL, the NFL has five different Hispanic subsegments that they're going after. Well, for one of the subsegments, it should be all in English. For another, it should be all in Spanish. It's also about the community, the localization. Depending on where you're putting that billboard, if it's a high-density Hispanic market that is of recent immigrants, you're going to put it in Spanish, right? So those are the things. It's not an easy answer. Yes, Hispanics do it in Spanish. You have to do the homework again to really understand who you're talking to and in the, lo in the locale that you're doing it. Then we also talk about uh, marketing through culture. This is my favorite question I ever got one time because I had a client, and he finally looked at me. He said, Heidi, can you please explain to me why everybody says Hispanics value family? Like, I value family. What does that mean, right? Like, I just can you put it into context? So what we talked about here is that it's the definition of family, right? I have a lot of fake aunts and uncles. I don't know about you, uh, because I didn't grow up around my, my blood family. So my, I have a grandmother that is not really my grandmother. I have a bunch of aunts and uncles and cousins that are not my blood relative. And when you look at them and you see me, I'm six feet tall and they're five foot two, people go, how are you guys related, right? Why is this important? For a lot of people, I, I think this example was used earlier. Um, we, had a, we were talking to a client one time and they wanted to do a promotion. And they insisted it was a Super Bowl promotion. I get it. Tickets are pricey and hard to find. So they wanted to do it, uh, two tickets. And I said, oof, big mistake. They're like, no, no, I mean, that's a great deal to be able to take you know, another person to a Super Bowl. I said, who do you pick? So if the husband wins, does he take his wife? Does he take the brother? Does he take the father? Does he take his son? That to me, don't run the promotion. You're creating more heartache than you're actually giving them a reward, right? So this understanding of what a family is, it's not that uh, the general market or whites do not love family. It just has a different meaning in terms of what's included within the family nucleus. Food, again, same question all the time, right? Everybody loves food, that's correct. But food has a different meaning, right? Food is something that allows you to bring this multi-generational household together and actually have something to talk about, right? Um, my nephew wrote his uh, essay for college, and in it he talked about how food was the one connector that he had, food and baseball, to talk to his grandfather. 
he didn't grow up around him, right? Grandfather's in Puerto Rico, comes to see him every two or three years. And it's like, hey, hey, what do you talk about? Well, you talk about mom's empanadas, alcapurrias, you talk about baseball and things like that. That's the importance of food. And when you look at statistics that eight out of 10 Hispanic millennials are eating in traditional Latin foods, that's significant, right? Did you know that salsa surpassed ketchup as the number one condiment in this country four years ago? Right? This is very significant stuff. And you see here some of the examples of how people are embracing that, right? Now you can get dulce de leche ice cream, the Girl Scouts, dulce de leche cookies. These are the entrepreneurs, the real entrepreneurs. You want to follow um, some trends? Follow the Girl Scouts. Uh, those girls know how to sell product. Um, then marketing through culture, music, again, a lot of people talk about this. We talked about this a little bit last night. Um, everybody loves music, but there's different relations to music, right? Uh, there's a different connection. You know, you take most people in this room and you take their uh, smartphone and look at their music, there's going to be a little bit of everything, right? You're going to have rock, you're going to have pop, you might have some regional Mexican music, I know you do, La Banda, and all of that, and then you're going to have some people um, that it's very, you know, across the board, right? They're going to have R&B, they're going to look at, you know, hard rock and all that. Very varied because of all the different experiences that they've had. You know, one of the things that we talk about is the fact that, you know, I don't know how many of you know the group, Mana, but you know that Mana holds the record for most consecutive sold out shows at Staples Center? Beating Madonna and others? I don't know how many of you are familiar, but Staples Center is like 23,000 seats and they sold out 11 shows in a row, right? It's a powerful thing, it's a powerful way to bring entertainment into the venue, right? And create a connection with that consumer. And my tip, and we debated this a little bit yesterday, is very market specific, but the biggest thing that teams struggle is how to integrate some of these things without alienating everybody else, right? Then don't go extremes, right? Don't go very deep if you think that in the market that doesn't maybe even appreciate country music or anything like that, then maybe you don't go all the way into Mexican regional music. That won't work in Miami, right? But you bring Juanes. I went to a concert in LA one time, and I was very curious because it was a, a benefit concert um, for President Clinton, uh, and all these people like Lady Gaga perform and all that, and then I was like, oh, this is gonna be interesting when Juanes gets up. I was dying, like to me, this was an experiment. I'm looking around. And all these people were like dancing. And I have a friend like, can you please tell me what he's saying? And I'm like, I'm not whispering in your ear the entire time explaining the song. Just keep dancing, right? Um, that's a really powerful way to actually speak to the community without alienating others, right? Because it's just something that's very relatable. There's plenty of rock bands. There's plenty of pop bands um, that really can drive that uh, connection point. So let's talk some examples, um, unless you guys have any questions. All right. Examples, Ford. Uh, I moved to Miami uh, from LA in 2012, and I'm watching the NBA Finals, I'm a big NBA fan, and all of a sudden this commercial comes up, and it was in Spanish. And I thought that I changed the channel by mistake, because I'm on ABC. And I was like, did this just happen? So I called a friend of mine, I'm like, did you see this? And they're like, yeah. And then we're like, do you think this was only in Miami? <laughs> and then we called another friend, I was like, did you see the same commercial we did? like, yeah, why? I'm like, I was blown away, right? This kills you. And so I called a friend of mine uh, that worked at ESPN. I said, how did you guys pull this off? It was actually a make good for Ford because they hadn't delivered uh, um, on other day parts. But they felt like this was a great opportunity. Ford wanted to push the envelope. And this provided a great vehicle, sorry for the pun, a great opportunity for them to do that by actually airing a Spanish language uh, ad with subtitles in English during the NBA Finals. It really took the industry by storm. Another example, talking about the Latinas again. JC Penney. If you watch, how many of you watched the 2014 World Cup? How many of you watched it on Univision? Oh, not many, okay. <laughs> you better have. <laughs> um, so if you watch uh, the World Cup on Univision, um, as a female sports fan, what you'll see is a lot of ads targeted to Hispanic males with a lot of scantily dressed women. Not sure what that has to do with the sport, but okay. 
But JCPenney was smart and broke through because they were the only advertiser that actually talked to Hispanic women and showed them an actual sports fans. And by the way, they look fabulous while doing it. This was a very significant campaign because it, there was nobody else using the World Cup to talk to Hispanic women and not as fans. Toyota, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this campaign, the Somos Muchos Latinos. So Toyota was going through um, the effects of a recall. So obviously trust in the brand had gone down significantly and the Hispanic consumer has always, had always been a key driver of their sales. So through research and insights, they came up with this uh, campaign. And the campaign is, and I'm gonna test this out for a few of you. Uh, Nancy, when somebody asks you about your ethnicity, what do you say? Okay. How about you? How do you, what do you say? There you go. Let's see, who else wants to offer? What do you guys say? I have somebody nodding here. When somebody asks you, what do you say? Yeah. Okay. So what Toyota found out was that that everybody represented themselves different, right? Some people say, uh-uh, I'm Mexican-American. Others say, I'm Chicano. Others say, I'm Puerto Rican. Others say, Boricua, right? So they allowed you, through these iPads, to come in and tell them who you were, and they printed a decal for your car. All of a sudden, you couldn't drive around and not see one of these cars. And I always say this as an example. Look at any car on the street. Who are the only people that have flags for their home countries on their rearview mirrors? Right? You've seen that. Nobody else, except if you're from Texas, because Texas people put their flag everywhere. But outside of that, <laughs> the only people that put some sort of demarcation of their ethnicity are Hispanics. And you see that a lot from the people from the islands, too. Uh, I have a lot of friends that they're very proud to show they're Jamaican or, or, and, and stuff like that. So that's why this campaign was really powerful. Last example, Coca-Cola. Did any of you see this? Um, definitely see it, but have a Kleenex box with you. Um, so very, very powerful campaign um, called Inseparable. Um, and the interesting thing was, uh, very well done in the fact that you could toggle and see the video from different viewpoints. So you could pick to be the mom and see everything that's happening in the evolution of her life through her eyes from holding her baby girl and the pride and the joy to then the girl entering those teenage years and telling her I hate you all the way to that baby girl now becoming a mom herself and now there's the grandson and it was very interesting because it really spoke to all aspects of the family, the family dynamic, the evolution, and it allowed you to, again, experience this through the different viewpoints because the different viewpoints were completely different. So a very you know, powerful story. Um, and then it allowed you at the end, because you felt very guilty, uh, it allowed you to make a phone call to your mom. <laughs> Any questions? Me and lunch. <laughs> Thank you.